And let's just return to uh, our, one of our top stories again. Joe Biden is in Angola, his only visit to Africa as U.S. president. Uh, Washington is backing a new 1,300-kilometer railway project linking an Angolan port with mining areas in Central Africa. His visit is being seen as the most direct counter yet to China's influence in Africa. Well, Professor Tunde Eshon is an African affairs analyst. He's also a professor of international relations with a focus on the history of African elections and democratic developments on the continent and beyond. He's been following events in Angola from here in Abuja, and he joins me now in the studio. Thank you very much indeed for Thank coming you, in. Charles. Just tell us, first of all, why this is President Biden's first and only visit to Africa from okay. your assessment. Um, uh, Biden, as it were, uh, was in Egypt in 2022 for G27, for COP27. It wasn't his first visit to Africa, but well, the first sub-Saharan Sub Africa. He was uh, in Egypt in 2022 for COP27, you understand? And uh, thereafter, he promised in 2022, in 2022, sorry, he promised in 2022 when there was U.S. African summit that he would visit Africa, you understand, as many countries as he could. So the intention was very strong, and uh, I could remember very well what, about the largest commitment and uh, pledge to African Union, $55 billion. Uh, dollars. That was huge. And not only that, he was one of the key leaders that motivated uh, participation of African Union in G20. You understand? One of the leading voices that said, look, uh, particularly us, you know, as a counter, mm. this thing to BRICS. So it's not so, such that uh, Biden has forgotten about Africa, but of course, a lot of uh, analysts and international relations experts have been saying that, look, uh, uh, compared to Obama, compared to past leaders. He has not, but let's not forget, but for the past two years, there are a lot of events around the world, mm. you know, such that uh, it is almost difficult, if not impossible. Yeah, that's a good for, point. Yeah, you understand? Mm. But the Ukraine war, and of course, the Middle East, the, the Middle East crisis, uh, in between U.S. election, of course, uh, and the campaigns came in. So it might not be totally correct to say, look, it's indifferent to Africa. It yeah. is, I want to believe that internationally, that he did what he should do, and that this latest visit is about to say, look, okay, I didn't forget you before in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, U.S. is equally committed to Africa, and I want to make this one. Right. I mean, in fairness to him, most of the other presidents did it in their second term. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's only got one term. Yeah. So, well, here we are. And yeah. this massive railway project yeah. um, known as the Lobito Corridor, yeah. what is the U.S. hoping to get out of it with Angola? Um, uh, when, when you look at it, uh, in 2013, China replaced U.S. as the biggest trading partner in Africa. And not only the massive investment in East and Africa, mm. Kenya and Uganda railways, and of course, uh, they are already discussing with some other countries in South Africa in order to develop their railways. Of course, China was in Nigeria. And the Lobito Corridor is so important. Why it is so strategic and important is because of the father. It's going to link Zambia, uh, Congo Republic, Democratic Republic of Congo, down to Angola and uh, to the port of Lobito. And it is not just about a railway or modern railway. It is, uh, it is uh, resuscitation and modernization of an old rail line that stretched from Zambia down to the coast. It is about uh, modernizing a railway system that can be counter for us, not only to China, but as you understand, a conveyor of key economic uh, benefits, mm. not only to the countries, but to the world. Remember that some of the countries with the biggest producers of cobalt, copper, and lithium are DRC, and of course Zambia, and some of these countries along that. That's why they call it Lobito Corridor. That's why it became popular. Uh, let me take you back, and uh, I remember very well that um, US, uh, it's a $800 million project, and US already pledged. $550 million. So it's a huge project. You mean billion. Uh, 
you know. Mm. It's a huge project, very, very important to the economic uh, development of the Southern African sub-region right. and key to the expansion of U.S. influence, not only in Southern Africa and Southern Africa sub-region, to as a counterpart to China influence in right. that region. But as you said, it's, it's a huge amount of money. And mm -hmm. as we mentioned, it's Mr. Biden's final weeks in, mm -hmm. in office. Yeah. A new president, Donald Trump, is coming in. Mm -hmm. um, is this project likely to continue to get funding under the Trump administration, or we just don't know? The funding has already been done, like I said, a pledge of about 550 well, million. Well, that's a pledge. That's a pledge. It's Which a can always part be of it, as rolled as back. Done. Yeah, it can be rolled back. But I don't think, it will, if you know Trump very well, he's more concerned about the influence, you know, counter, countering the influence of China in Africa, in other parts of the world. So anything China, you know, he will likely pursue it. No mm. doubt about that. And, and beyond the it. economy, um, yeah. We've heard a lot of people who say that human rights have been serially violated in Angola. Yeah. There are reports suggesting that President Joe Lorenzo has been clamping down on freedom of speech, mm. etc., on the opposition and so on. Is there a sense from the op political opposition in Angola that Mr. Biden's visit is tantamount to an endorsement of this? alleged stifling of dissent by the president? <laughs> That's quite interesting because uh, that might not come into play or into strong consideration when it comes to issues like this. Uh, we are talking about economic interest and uh, compared to some other parts of Africa, including DRC, mm. Central African Republic, uh, Angola, I mean, you know, cannot... Uh, it's a little bit better when it comes to this. And some of these fundamentals must have been weighed and critically examined by the key officials in the Secretary of State office, even before Joe Biden set out and said, look, I'm coming to Africa. But like I said, most importantly, the increasing sphere of influence of China far you know, outweighs the, you know, the, in quote, mundane considerations of, in quote, that's what I use mm -hmm. that word, of uh, human rights abuse and all that. And of course, um, you, can, you can always say that uh, about Lorenko, strong against the opposition, but at the same time, uh, is very, very forward looking. And he must have, behind the scene of this team, played a lot, a lot of rules and a lot of pressures to make sure that the US interest is not abandoned in the project. Well, I mean, the, the reason I say this is that we haven't really heard the US talking about these human rights violations, mm -hmm. um, which is a bit unusual given the way the Americans usually engage with Africa, yeah, uh, waving the big sort of moral stick. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering whether in the face of the reality of the competition with China, yeah. a country that never talks about issues of human rights, human the rule rights of law, et cetera, yeah. whether the US is now also adopting that muted tone <laughs> uh, it might not be, like I said, it might not be. Uh, it's uh, sober, you understand, and the sober, what, what I would call sober uh, approach, uh, and the, you know, downplaying such factors at this time, like I said, might not necessarily mean a fundamental change in the position on the stance of U.S. when it comes to fundamental human rights and its abuse right. in other parts of the world. But like I said, uh, there are other fundamentals that propelled, that motivated, and that encouraged Joe Biden to come. More importantly, the economic factor. Right. Yeah. And, and, and do you think that people in Angola, I mean, you, you're sort of monitoring developments there, or indeed elsewhere in Africa, yeah. possibly including Nigeria, mm. um, might be offended that Mr. Biden has left it till his last six weeks in office to the, come to the continent and is visiting just one country because usually they do like several yeah, countries. Yeah. And as you said, when he said he was coming, yeah. he wanted to go to several yeah. places. No, uh, there will be a bit of understanding uh, behind the scene. Uh, everybody knows exactly what's been going on. Blanking has been trying, literally shuttling between, you know, Washington, 
Cairo, you understand, Rabat, and many of the countries in, in North Africa, in sub, uh, not necessarily sub saharan Africa, you understand. And uh, it, I don't think so. They won't feel offended. On his way to Angola, he did a stopover in Cape Verde, and of course, he was met by the Cape Verde Prime Minister. So they won't feel bad that far. Like you rightly said, um, he must have said that, okay, felt naturally during his second time there will be a lot of, you know, engagement with Africa that will involve physical, you know, presence on some of, the, some of the African countries. So I don't think many of the African countries will, be, will feel offended, no. And what about Nigeria? What's the mood here? Because it's starting to look like all these um, sort of big global leaders always give Nigeria a miss. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting, like um, you observe, uh, a lot of us have been looking at it, particularly international relations experts. What could have motivated Biden not to have, I mean, not, I mean, what could have motivated him to go to Angola, to go to Luanda without a stopover in Abuja? But it goes beyond that, there are a lot of factors that uh, comes into play when it comes to international relations engagement at such level. So, I, uh, yes, a lot of people might say, okay, Africa, Nigeria, and South Africa, but don't forget that South African president is always a key member of the G20, mm. a respected member of the G20. They were together some few weeks back. And uh, in some of the international engagement, he has always been, and of course, a leading member of the BRICS. So he won't feel that offended. Maybe we, depends on the way we look at it, you understand? Uh, I believe Abuja is looking at that, and they might want to take a closer look at a way of encouraging such in future. Right, but yeah. um, the way that you would look at it then, beyond the way the government would look the at way, it? The way I would look at it is that uh, we probably need to do a lot more, you understand, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, developing an outward perception that encourage and motivate respect to our nation. That's the way I look at it. We need to do a lot more, you understand? Maybe in terms of economic diplomacy, you understand? In terms of political diplomacy, and under the table, you understand, engagement, particularly involving experts when it comes to issues like this. I, would like, I think we need to do a lot more than what we are doing. Well, now we know why you're the Professor of International Relations. <laughs> I want to thank you very much <laughs> indeed. Thank professor much. Chunde Esion is an African Affairs Analyst. He's thank also you. a Professor, as I mentioned, of International Relations with a focus on the history of African elections and democratic developments on the continent and beyond. And he's been following events in Angola from here in Abuja. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Charles.